Hi guys and welcome back to another true crime in makeup time video. If you're new here, my name is Zara and I post a new true crime video every single week. So if you love makeup and you love true crime, I would love if you guys would subscribe and it would mean so much to me. And if you have any cool case suggestions, go ahead and leave them down below because I love to hear new stories, new cases. I'm down for it. So leave me some comments uh, with case suggestions and I would love to do those for you guys. Today's case I happened to just stumble across. I can't remember how I found it, but I just started reading about it and I got so hooked on it that I was like, oh my God, I need to talk about this. It's essentially, I would say an unsolved case. It's kind of crazy, the circumstances surrounding this case. And I would love to know what you guys think and what your opinions are about what happened to Sneha Phillips. Can you guys see how stained my eyelids are? I did like this pink look a couple days back and it's still stained. Like, can you see that? It's crazy. So Sneha Ann Phillips was born on the 7th of October, 1969 in the Indian state of Kerala. And she later moved with her parents to upstate New York in the United States. She graduated from John Hopkins University where Sneha decided to pursue a career in medicine. So she then enrolled in the Chicago School of Medicine in the year 1995. At this school, she met Ron Lieberman and he was also a student at the school, but he was a year behind her. And the two of them, they began dating. The two of them, apart from their careers, also shared their creative interests. He was interested in music and she was interested in painting. And then Sneha even took a year off traveling from Italy so that the two of them could graduate the School of Medicine together. They then moved to New York together and they both had internships there. Ron was at Jacoby Medical Center in the Bronx, while Sneha did hers at Cabrini Medical Center, which was just close to their apartment in New York. And they lived in the East Village. The couple got married in May 2000 in a small ceremony in Dutchess County, and they combined Ron's Judaism beliefs with Sneha's South Indian Syrian Malaba Christianity religion. That's a lot. Ron even gifted Sneha a minu during their wedding, which was basically a traditional Indian gold teardrop earring with a diamond inside, like it was traditional to give it on the wedding day. And then after they got married, the two of them moved into a larger apartment, still in New York, but in Battery Park City. It was on Monday, September 10th, 2001, that 31 year old Sneha just had a low key yet sort of busy day planned ahead. Ron says he kissed his wife goodbye and left their apartment in Battery Park City at around 11 a.m. that day. Ron had a pretty demanding job as an emergency room intern at the Jacoby Medical Center in the Bronx, and he left in plenty of time so that he wouldn't be late uh, to work for his super long shift that day. After playing with her two kittens, Figa and Kali, Sneha, she cleaned the apartment as she was preparing for a dinner party that she had scheduled with her cousin Anu um, the following Wednesday. She also repotted some purple and white orchids that she had ordered from Hawaii and then she left them in the bathtub to drain. At around 2 p.m., Sneha sends her mother like an instant message on the computer and that turned into a really long conversation with her mother and they ended up chatting for two hours online and they talked about a lot of stuff but mainly they were discussing how Sneha and Ron they had been to a bar like the previous weekend and Ron turned into like he pulled out his guitar and he turned into a jamming session at the bar and how they had a really good time and then they were also discussing Sneha's upcoming plans for the week. She even mentioned her plan that she was going to visit this restaurant on top of the World Trade Center North Tower called Windows on the World, where her friend was planning to actually have his wedding take place. So finally, at around 4 p.m., she hangs up the phone with her mother and she goes to run her errands. After dropping off her dry cleaning, Sneha goes to Century 21, which is a discount shopping outlet in New York. 
And she was a regular at that store and it was only located like a few blocks away from her apartment. And this shopping center was also just down the road from the World Trade Center. Shortly after 6 p.m., Sneha uses her credit card to buy lingerie, a dress, pantyhose, and some bed linen. And then she moves on to the shoe area and she buys three pairs of shoes. And a cashier at the store actually remembers seeing Sneha and she remembers that Sneha was actually shopping with another young Indian woman. And um, this has just never been confirmed because this woman has never come forward or revealed herself. So she finishes her day of shopping and as Sneha steps outside the Century 21 shopping center, she is never seen again. So Sneha was five feet, six inches tall, and she weighed about 115 pounds, and she had a mole on her left cheek. She was last seen wearing a short-sleeved brown button-down shirt dress, sandals, and a black and gold beaded necklace with a cross pendant on it. She also wore her gold solitaire cut engagement ring and her wedding band, which was also gold with small inset diamonds on it. And she also wore flower shaped um, diamond stud earrings. Ron says that when he gets home from work that night, just before midnight on September 10th, that Sneha was nowhere to be found. He thought that she was just gonna be out late that night or maybe even all night because she had done that before. So he just didn't think much of it. And then later on when this investigation was taking place, so Ron gets home on September 10th, just before midnight, probably goes to bed thinking Sneha's not there. She's going to come back later, whatever. But someone called Ron's mobile phone from the apartment phone at 4 a.m. that same night. And Ron says he doesn't remember this call taking place, but that perhaps he woke up at around 4 a.m., you know, and called his mobile phone to check his voicemail. By the next morning, Sneha still had not arrived home and he was a bit annoyed at her, but he was also kind of like, whatever, because he just assumed that she had stayed out late or stayed overnight. Well, it would have been stayed overnight at this point at a friend's house or her brother or her cousin's house. But he also didn't call anyone or call Sneha to check where she was. So I found that a bit weird. So he left for work once again at 6.45 a.m., he took the subway to work and he got to Jacoby Medical Center at 8 a.m. that day um, because he had a meeting. Shortly after the meeting at around 9 a.m., Ron goes and joins some of his co-workers who were gathered around a TV and they were just watching TV. So he's like, I'm gonna chill with you guys. And as they were watching, he was horrified to discover that a plane had struck the North Tower of the World Trade Center which was only located about two blocks away from their apartment. Ron heard the news, so he rushes over and tries to call Sneha to make sure she's okay. However, she doesn't answer. And then as he goes back to the TV, he goes, okay, you know, maybe this crash was just an accident. Until 15 minutes later, a second plane crashes into the towers. Again, this occurred just minutes away from their apartment. He tried to call Sneha again, but she didn't answer. And then Ron says he repeatedly tried to call her and she just wouldn't answer. So then he contacts her family and he asks, okay, have you heard like what's happening with Sneha? And her whole family had not heard from her either. So Ron then catches a ride um, on an ambulance to get home to him, uh, his and Sneha's apartment. But it took over six hours to even make it to the apartment because there were so many people trying to flee Manhattan after, you know, what had happened. And when I looked this up, Normally that ride would normally take like 30 to 45 minutes. So the fact that it took six hours, can you imagine the chaos and everything that was happening during that time? So when Ron made it home, he realized that the electricity in the building had gone out and he could not bypass the automatic locks in the building. He was running around the building, calling out Sneha's name, when eventually someone from the building said, well, what's wrong, what's the matter? He asked them to go and knock on his apartment door and the person did and then there was no answer from inside the apartment. So with no luck and no response, Ron ends up spending 
the night at a friend's apartment, which was close by, and he was able to gain entry into the building early the next morning. And when he opened the apartment door, he said he was met with a surreal scene. Grey soot and debris from when the Twin Towers collapsed had seeped in through an open window and had collected on every single surface in the apartment. The only footprints visible were those made by the cats. Ron began to wonder if Sneha was killed in the Twin Tower attacks when a woman matching her description was seen on the building's camera footage. At 8.43 a.m., just three minutes before the first attack on the tower, a woman matching Sneha's description had entered the building. While they entered the lobby of the building and then waited for an elevator for just a couple of minutes when they abruptly left the building, which I'm guessing is when that person, whether it was Sneha or not, heard the, you know, the attacks. The woman seen on the footage had a similar build and even haircut to Sneha, And she was also wearing the same type of dress that Sneha had on while shopping. But then why would she have the same, if it was Sneha, why would she have the same dress on unless she really did spend the night somewhere else, you know? Ron thought that maybe, you know, if it was Sneha, she entered the building, she was about to go home and then she heard what had happened outside and she ran outside to see what was going on. I mean, like any normal person would. I mean, you hear this freaking, I don't even know what it would have sounded like when the plane crashed into that building. And given that she was actually a medical intern, when she saw the chaos and what was happening, she probably wanted to put her, you know, skills to use. However, authorities were unable to actually confirm whether it was Sneha in the footage. I mean, it's, was there anybody else in the building who lived there that looked like Sneha? wearing the same dress like it it seems strange doesn't it so for, so something that annoys me about this is that they say that she had the same build and haircut and she was wearing the same dress but then when i did a little bit more research authorities were saying that sun was actually beaming into the lobby of the apartment and it was washing out the camera footage so it was making everything really hard to see and all you could really see of the woman was her silhouette so I'm like, what? How in one report do you say she looked just like Sneha wearing the same dress, same haircut? Then you're saying it's washed out footage. So that bit was a little bit unclear to me because if it was a woman that looked like Sneha wearing the same thing, same haircut, guys, it most probably was her, right? But then another thing that the police were saying that debunks the fact that they think it was Sneha was the fact that this woman was not carrying any shopping bags, which Sneha would have been, right, if she had come back or wherever she spent the night, she would have had that shopping, those shopping bags from Century 21. As Ron would later learn, she didn't spend the night at any known friend's house or her brother's or her cousin's. They know that she did communicate with her mother on that instant messenger app at around 2.30 p.m. and then she left the building at 5-ish to run all her errands. An employee of the building also remembers seeing her leave at that time. So Ron goes and tracks down the surveillance footage from the Century 21 store and eventually he does find Sneha on it. And after she leaves, you know, the department center, there's no trace of her. On the video, she's seen carrying two big bags of shopping. However, these bags of shopping were never found at the apartment. A shoe clerk from the department store sees Sneha's missing persons flyer and decides to contact Ron. And she tells him that she saw Sneha with this other woman that night. Sneha had apparently told this clerk that um, this woman was a friend of hers, but this friend, she just never, never came forward. Ron then believes that he actually found this woman on the surveillance footage um, of the department store, leaving the store with Sneha. And obviously this is a really bad time to go missing because the department, the police department, were so busy, so busy with the 9-11 attacks that he had to just hire a private investigator on his own to figure out what happened. He wanted to track down anyone who may have seen Sneha after she left the department store. And her family and friends actually placed several missing posters around New York City. Ron tried to get the media interested in his wife's disappearance, but because it was really difficult for him to prove that it was related to the 9-11 attacks, They had no interest in it. So he called Sneha's brother John and asked him to contact the media and spread the word about Sneha's disappearance. But he said that he wanted to leave out key details like, you know, when the last time Sneha actually was seen because he wanted the, you know, reporters to actually do their research. 
But unbelievably, Sneha's brother John instead, which is insane, fabricates this story about him speaking to Sneha on the phone while she was out in the field tending to the injured victims of the 9-11 attacks. Like, who makes that shit up? He said he was on the phone with her and she was telling him that, oh, I can't leave these people, they're all injured and I need to help them. And he said the last thing he heard from her was her saying, oh my God, I have to help this person. And then before the phone, you know, cut off. He eventually admitted his lie to the police, but by that point, the media had already taken it and ran with it. And Sneha's hero sort of, um, what do you call it, like title was already established. Sneha's name was eventually added to the official list of the um, victims of the 9-11 attack. And her family attended a number of memorials and tributes for these victims. At these memorials, the family felt some sense of peace as they were mourning with other families who had also lost loved ones during this tragic day. In 2003, Ron, he files a petition with the New York surrogate court to have Sneha's name sort of officially added to the list of the 9-11 victims, because I think it was eventually added to a list, like earlier when they were attending the memorials, but prior, but after that, he wanted it to be official, you know, like in writing, on like the official lists because at the same time he also applied for a claim with the victims compensation fund now given sneha's age at the time of her death and her career and the way it was headed ron was in line to receive between three and four million dollars in compensation in 2004 the medical examiner removed sneha's name just checking it's filming removed sneha's name from the official list of the victims of the 9-11 attack because the medical examiner's office explained that they actually had no evidence or way to prove that Sneha was even alive on September 11th when she went missing on September 10th. And on June 29th, 2006, a surrogate court judge ruled that it could not be proven that Sneha died on September 11th, 2001. And instead her date of death was documented as September 10th, 2004, three years after she initially went missing. And this was in accordance with the state law. In the ruling, the judge points to the original police report and the evidence in that, which states that Sneha may have disappeared intentionally or she was murdered. Seeing as Ron could not produce a um, death certificate which showed Sneha's death um, to occur on September 11th, 2001, the Victim Compensation Fund just denied his claim and he wasn't ever given that three to four million dollars that he believed he was entitled to. But the case wasn't even over yet. On 31st January 2008, a five judge panel ruled four to one to overturn the previous court's ruling and to once again declare Sneha a victim of the of the 9-11 attacks. And this officially made her the 2,571st victim of the World Trade Collapse. Her name was added to panel S66 of the National September 11th Memorials South Regardless of this new ruling, um, which declared her now as a victim, Ron wasn't able to get any money uh, from the Victims' Compensation Fund because they closed all their payouts in 2003, two years after the attacks, and this ruling was only made in 2008. And to be honest, you know, at that point, there was probably no money left even if they wanted to give him some of the money. The majority of judges admitted there was a lack of evidence that actually placed Sneha at ground zero, but they noted as follows, the clear and convincing standard does not require an absolute certainty. It merely requires that the evidence make the conclusion to be highly probable. According to the judges, it is highly likely that Sneha died at ground zero. They believed that, you know, if she had died any other way, that her body at this point would have shown up. Additionally, they seriously questioned the evidence in the police report, which suggested that Sneha met with foul play, as again, there was no evidence to prove that either, and they labeled most of that evidence as hearsay. So yes, there was a possibility that Sneha was 
indeed a victim of the 9-11 attacks. And as mentioned before, the courts ruled that yes, that was indeed the case. And also Sneha's family and her husband Ron are very vocal in the fact that they assert that Sneha died a hero in the 9-11 attacks. But there are also a number of reasons why people don't believe that Sneha died at the during the 9-11 attacks. Firstly, obviously, no evidence has been found to suggest that Sneha was killed in those attacks. And at least 60% of the victims from the World Trade attacks have been identified by 2019 through DNA testing of remains or by identifying jewelry or other, you know, belongings that they found at the scene. But in Sneha's case, no um, DNA was ever found of, of hers among the rubble. But in Sneha's case, her DNA was never found at the scene and, you know, neither did her belongings, shopping bags or her clothing or her jewelry. But I mean, it's a bit like, that's a bit of a silly reason to be like, oh, she wasn't killed there. Cause they're saying 60% had been found. That still leaves 40% that was not found. You know what I mean? She could be among that 40%. So I feel like, I don't know. So to me, that doesn't mean that she wasn't there. I mean, can you imagine having to be one of the people going through that debris and the bodies and the carnage? Like, I don't even know how they clean these kinds of crimes and events up. I mean, anyone from New York watching, do you guys know? Do you guys remember how New York was even cleaned up after this massive attack? Someone comment below, how long did it take before the streets of New York were sort of normal again. The debris, the rubble, the bodies were removed. How long did it take? Secondly, it was never confirmed that Sneha was actually the woman that they captured in the lobby footage of their apartment building. Really, there was no evidence to ever suggest that she even made it home um, the night of the 10th or if she was even around when the September 11th attacks took place. The opposing judge who wanted to declare Sneha as not a victim of the attacks stated, since it is not known where the deceased spent the night of September 10th, it requires speculation to say that her route home took her across or dangerously near the World Trade Center grounds or that even at 8.48 a.m. when the attacks began, she was even near the vicinity of the World Trade Centers. Which brings us finally to the third reason of why it's improbable that Sneha died in the World Trade attacks. And that opposing judge went on to say that the ruling declaring Sneha a victim of 9-11 was just based on speculation. And it is in his opinion, and it is equally probable that Sneha's personal and professional problems somehow led to her death. Which brings us to Sneha's personal life. Was she a victim of foul play? During their investigation into Sneha's disappearance, the police found evidence to suggest that Sneha had been living a double life and in their view, her life had begun spiraling out of control. So allegedly in spring of 2001, Sneha had been told by her employer that her internship and her contract was not going to be renewed. And the reason for this was tardiness and alcohol related issues. So basically she was always late and she had substance abuse problems. After being informed that she was basically fired, Sneha and her colleagues, they went to a bar for some drinks. And during this outing, Sneha later told the police that one of the interns had groped her, but the police didn't believe her. And Sneha actually ended up in jail that day um, for falsely reporting an incident. I wonder why they didn't believe her. I mean, that's so weird. And get this, the prosecutor offered to drop the charges against Sneha if she recanted her original complaint. But Sneha stood her ground and she was like, no, I'm not dropping it. This really happened. So after being fired and spending this time in jail, Sneha was able to land a new internship at St. Vincent's Medical Center. But it did not last long because that position came with strict stipulations, which she didn't follow. And when she failed to meet with her substance abuse counselor, Sneha was suspended, which is the reason why she wasn't at work on September 10th. So now, although they were only married in May of 2001, the police report includes interviews that suggest that Sneha and Ron's marriage had already been falling apart. 
that by the fall of 2001, they were already experiencing pretty bad marital issues. The police learned that Sneha often stayed out all night at bars, often with individuals that Ron did not know about. She met these people at the bars and she usually hung out at lesbian bars. And then during an interview with Sneha's brother, John, John tells the police that something that shocked them, which was one time he walked in on Sneha and his girlfriend having sex. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I don't know how much I believe of that because John has already been proven to be a liar. So it's like, did he make up this story again to just have a story out and to be valuable to the police? Like, I don't really know if I believe that. Taking into account Sneha's substance abuse issues and her erratic behavior, the police just determined that she probably met with some foul play. They believe that Sneha could have easily gotten mixed up with some of the wrong people on the night of September 10th and that led to her death. But the question still remains, how did these people, if this happened, get rid of her body in a city crawling with police just hours later after the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks? Sneha's family, however, strongly disagrees with the police report. They say, yes, yeah, she'd like to have a good time, but there's no way she had a substance abuse problem. They said that Sneha hung out at lesbian bars because men always hit on her, and then after that groping incident, she just wanted to be left alone. And they say, yes, sometimes she went home with women from the bar, but that was more because she became fast friends with people and liked to just have innocent fun. In Ron's interview, he says there was no way that Sneha was bisexual or even cheating on him. And then John later on denies ever telling the police that he walked in on his girlfriend and Sneha having sex. He just denied it. He was like, I didn't tell you that. And in the end, Sneha's loved ones and the courts disagree with with what the police say they found. But it's unclear what motivation the police would have to try and either lie about this or force this sort of um, theory. It actually would have been much easier for them to just be like, okay, you know what, Sneha actually did die during the 9-11 attacks, you know, case closed and that was it. But they didn't do this. Instead, they spent countless hours, you know, running this investigation only to come up with the conclusion that nobody wanted to hear. So then another possibility, and I'm sure a few of you guys have been thinking about this like I have, is that Sneha was killed by her husband. So something that was failed to be mentioned in terms of, you know, her last day, because this took place on her last day, but it really wasn't mentioned, was the fact that on September 10th, 2001, that morning, Sneha actually appeared in court to plead not guilty to the charge of filing a false complaint in relation to that groping allegation. According to the police, witnesses came forward saying they heard Sneha and Ron having a huge argument outside the courtroom and they were arguing about her substance abuse problems and her lesbianism. So that's really strange. People didn't know about her, you know what I mean? Like, why would they try to make that up? And then apparently Sneha was enraged. She took off and she left Ron behind. And then the thing about her being at court is so weird because there would have been official documentation about that, you know, because she would have had a court hearing with her name on it. Yeah, and it just wasn't mentioned much. And then I'm guessing also they went to court really early in the morning because Ron apparently left his house at 11 a.m. for work. And I'm I'm sure that he actually did because remember the building had uh, security footage so he couldn't have lied about leaving for work, right? Then there is that weird phone call that took place at 4 a.m. calling Ron's phone. I mean, there could be a really simple explanation to that, but isn't that weird? He claimed he was the only one at home on the night of September 10th, yet someone called his cell phone at approximately 4 a.m. on the morning of the 11th, so the 10th night morning of the 11th. Ron said he never remembered placing that call, but maybe he was checking his voicemail. But there's another theory that maybe Sneha returned home around that time, noticed Ron was not at home, maybe he was looking for her, and she called him, or maybe, you know, she came home, didn't know he was at home, she called him, and then their fight from earlier that morning continued. And then it's unclear how well Ron and Sneha's apartment was even searched. Like, did Ron have time to kill Sneha, clean up the body, clean up the scene, and somehow, like, hide her body in the chaos following 9-11? Like, that's a possibility. And if, but if he did, where could this dump site have been hidden in all these years? You know what I mean? Like, unless her remains were burned. So Ron denies that there was ever a fight that took place at the courthouse, and he stands by that he had nothing to do with her disappearance. 
And then later on during their investigation, the police ruled out his involvement in her disappearance. And I guess in a way his behavior supports that he was actually looking for her because he took a month off work to search for her. And when that failed, he hired a private investigator. And Sneha's family also believes that Ron had nothing to do with it because he eventually left that apartment that they shared together and he went to live with her family. Did Sneha just walk away from her life? In a sad and strange coincidence, Sneha vanishes from the city of Manhattan the night before one of the most tragic events in American history ever takes place, in which thousands of people were suddenly gone and never found. But there is no evidence that Sneha ever made preparations to actually leave. Her computer was searched and she never ever looked up um, you know, how to disappear or how to leave without a trace or even destinations of where she could go to. And she also left behind her passport, her driver's license, and majority of her credit cards, except for that one that she took shopping with her to Century 21. And she also left behind her glasses. Sneha was extremely close to her mom. And when her mom was later interviewed, she said that Sneha, she tells me everything. There's no way she ran away. So it seems that there's little chance that she actually disappeared on her own. And, you know, managed to remain out of contact with her family for all these years. So when Sneha was officially declared, you know, a victim of the 9-11 attacks, it finally gave her family some closure. It gave them a concrete reason for her disappearance and her addition to the 9-11 memorial also gave them a place to grieve and honor Sneha. Sneha's mom made a comment stating that, I don't even have a grain of hope that she's alive or that anything else happened to her. It's more peaceful for me to think she died in the World Trade Center than... I cannot bear to think that somebody killed her. For many, this case is closed, but it's crazy. I mean, what happened to her? Will we ever know? Several questions remain, you know, if Sneha wasn't killed on the night of September 10th, where did she stay that night if she wasn't with her brother or her cousins or any friends that they knew? Did she leave the department store with this mysterious woman and go somewhere else? I mean, why was she never found? Why didn't she ever come forward if she had nothing to do with it? Did Sneha go to another bar and then something happened? There's a theory that she met with foul play after she left the store, that she probably went across the street to the Millennial Hotel bar, and she may have either stayed there overnight drinking and then died during the attacks. And her friends and family believe that finding this mysterious woman is the key to solving her disappearance. What do you guys think of this case? I really hate leaving a story unfinished because I'm so curious as to the fact of what actually happened to her. It's like... It's crazy. If it was foul play, then was the perp super lucky to have this tragic, you know, attack and event in history take place that he could have just hidden her body somewhere? But I mean, again, for those who live in New York, do you guys know the process of what happened? How did they sort through the bodies? Like, I don't even know how they would do that, you know? And I mean, the only thing I can think of is that, you know, there was probably a ton of fire and stuff like that during those, um, during the aftermath of the attacks. And Unless this guy was smart enough to go that close to the to the um, to ground zero to dump her body in a fire or something like that, like I don't know, does that sound really dumb? Like no one would be going towards ground zero. So if there was someone that was taking a body to ground zero, wouldn't wouldn't someone have remembered that? But I guess people are too worried about them, their own selves. They're in chaos. They're fleeing the scene. Like they're not thinking about anyone else, you know. So. I don't think she died in the attacks because how? Unless she stayed near someone's house closer to the World Trade Center. And I mean, I don't know, just as simple as walking home in the morning and, you know, the building falls down. I mean, who knows? But then again, wouldn't her remains be found? I'm just thinking out loud right now. I don't know. What do you guys think of this? I hope it's not frustrating because it's frustrating to me, but... Yeah, I would love to know your thoughts on, on theories on what you guys think happened to her. So let me know your thoughts on this case down below, guys. I hope you found it interesting. And I will see you on the next one, guys. Besitos. Mwah. Bye.